Can a soul, or the essence of an entity, become trapped inside of an object? Could one channeling enough energy, dedication, and care into something allow an otherworldly presence to possess it, attracting spirits, like moths, to a flame? We have covered haunted objects here before, such as Akiku the doll, among others. But this story is too infamous to not be given the time of day. And although it has been told many times, perhaps you will learn a detail or two that you've never heard before. This is the untold story of Robert the Doll and the malevolent monstrosity that stares at the world from behind its beady little eyes. At first glance, most people tend to agree that although dolls of all sorts can be creepy to say the least, there is something particularly unnerving about the doll that has become known to the world as Robert. But behind the initial feelings of unease at first glance lies many tales of accidents, tragedy, and misfortune, all supposedly at Robert's hands. Far too many within his presence to just be a string of awful coincidences. But if an evil force supposedly lives within the confines of this century-old child's toy, to come to recognize and understand just what it could be, we must first tell its story. And to tell Robert's story properly, we must first start at the very beginning. As with many legends, there are multiple versions of the origin story and how Robert the doll came to be. Having read through most, if not all of them, I'll be sharing with you the most agreed upon origin for accuracy's sake in the beginning, and we will explore other theories and origin stories later in this video. The year is 1904, and a man named Thomas Otto is on a trip in Germany. Whether it was for business or leisure, we can't say, but during his trip, he decided to pick up a gift for his young grandson's birthday to take back home with him to the States. As he perused various shops throughout his time there, he stumbled across a toy that he believed would be the perfect fit for the young boy. Perched on display behind a pale glass window sat a doll. The doll was about the size of a young child and was accompanied by a small dog doll as well. Knowing that his grandson was lonely on the large family estate and was very fond of dogs as well, Thomas believed he had found what he had been searching for and quickly purchased the toy. In due time, he would find his way back to the United States once his trip was over, bringing his precious cargo with him. Making his way back to the family estate located in Key West, Florida, to greet his family after months abroad, Thomas, in an act of innocence and excitement, gifted the toy to his grandson Eugene for his eighth birthday. As soon as Eugene laid eyes on the gift he had received, he became ecstatic. With no other children his own age in the home or nearby, he now for once had his very own friend, his own best friend, and one that could accompany him wherever he went. Sitting at around three feet tall with his little dog, Eugene named his new friend Robert. But Robert of course needed clothes to fit for years of adventures to come. So Eugene's mother, Maria, quickly found just what he was missing. A small sailor's outfit that had once belonged to her son, but had long since been outgrown. After placing Robert in his new clothes, the two were off to play, and soon became inseparable. Wherever Eugene went, Robert accompanied him. From hours of play inside and outside of the house, to the dinner table, and bedtime, his new best friend was everything the young man wanted, and much more. Besides constant companionship, Eugene began to confide in the doll, often speaking to him as if he was a person in his own right. His parents, who were first just as elated as their young son was at his excitement over his new toy, began to grow concerned over how close their son was to the doll, but they would initially write off the behavior as most would, since lonely children with their imaginations still very much active will typically invent imaginary friends or adventurous stories to fill the void or lack of friends and real adventures 
within their daily lives. But over the months since Robert had arrived, they noticed a bizarre shift in Eugene's personality. He began to grow extremely possessive and obsessive over Robert and would lash out at his parents, sometimes violently, if the doll was not in his sight at all times. It would soon appear that Eugene's obsession with his cloth companion and shift in behavior wasn't the only strange activity that was taking place. One night, as she tucked her son into bed, Maria overheard Eugene whispering to Robert, something that at this point had become a daily occurrence. But as she closed the door to his room and began to walk away, she heard a deep, guttural voice respond to her son. Shocked and terrified, she rushed back into her son's room, only to find him laying with the doll, as per usual. When she asked him just who was speaking, he simply answered, Robert. This scary happening wouldn't be the last. About a year into Robert the doll inhabiting their Key West estate, the Autos noticed yet another shift in their son's behavior. But this time, it was almost the exact opposite of what the initial shift had been. Eugene had gone from a quiet and shy but charming young man to a belligerent, angry, and possessive boy. But now, he had become one that was meek, full of anxiety, and constantly seemed like he was walking on eggshells. He had now also taken to violent fits on occasion, as if something was trying to overtake his body and soul. The guttural voice that Maria had heard a year ago could be heard much more frequently now, and just as frequently, almost nightly, it became commonplace to hear what sounded like glass breaking and constant commotion coming from Eugene's room. Upon hearing the turmoil, his parents would rush to discover the source. Upon opening their son's door, they would find his furniture dumped upside down. Other toys of his would be smashed or in pieces. And Eugene would almost always be in the corner of the room in his bed petrified, while Robert the doll would be in his usual space, nearby. Upon asking just what had happened, they would be met with an all too familiar answer at this point. They would ask, just who did this Eugene? And his answer would always be, Robert. Noticing the activity becoming more and more intense, and being a God-fearing woman herself, Maria was deeply disturbed by what was taking place in her home and what was taking place to her family, particularly her son. Besides the nightly terror that now plagued them, she was very much disturbed by this guttural voice that she kept hearing. Knowing that her son had not yet matured, she knew that there was no way his voice could reach that deep level of tonality and malice that she often heard. At times, the voice would even shout and speak over Eugene, and unless he was exceptionally good at ventriloquism, something was horrifically wrong. It was as if the devil himself now occupied the walls of their home. Like a stain or a liquid, the presence had slowly seeped in and permeated throughout their lives. One night, as per usual, the family settles down to sleep. As the clouds spiral and the moon now haunts the sky above them, gleaming down overhead, the family's peace is shattered by the horrific screams of their son and the echoes of the sounds of things being broken. Wide-eyed and terrified, Eugene's parents rush to their son's aid. Lantern in hand, the closer they get to his room, the louder the low and horrible voice becomes and the louder the screams of Eugene become as well. The deep voice that had been growing louder suddenly was silent like the winter snow as hands touched the doorknob. Quickly overcoming their fear for the sake of their boy, the couple throw the door open to find their son huddled underneath his sheets. His room was almost completely destroyed. Most of his belongings were in pieces or tatters. From what was left of his toys, 
to his furniture, to even his clothes. Poor Eugene was shaking in the corner of his room, opposite his bed, and Robert, along with his beady-eyed companion, were in his bed, staring at them all, silently. By this point, Maria knew that whatever Robert was, or whatever inhabited him, was truly evil. But unsure of how to handle the situation, or what exactly they were dealing with, in a fit of rage, she grabbed the doll and rushed to the attic, casting Robert and his canine companion into the darkness above. This would remain his home until a better idea presented itself as to what to do with him. The low groans and screams and breaking ceased in Eugene's room, but would frequently be heard in the attic. With having such a large estate to care for, the family did have a team of servants to care for the property, but their loyal crew, having experienced the strangeness themselves, up and quit. The servants soon became a revolving door, with new faces almost always coming and going just as quickly as they started. Despite his banishment to the attic, alongside the occasional crashing sounds and yelling, the family said that they would also hear Robert walking around, the pitter-patter of his small feet often being heard, echoing all throughout the house, especially at night, when he seemed to truly come alive, so to speak. As the years passed, and despite all of the childhood trauma and fear inflicted on him by the demonic doll, unbeknownst to any rational mind, after his parents' passing, Eugene would choose to take Robert back into his possession as an adult. Perhaps he did this to ensure that Robert wouldn't inflict terror upon anyone else. Maybe he felt like he had the most experience dealing with him, and therefore he was the most equipped to handle anything that could possibly happen as a result of his presence. Eugene in his adult years became an artist, and would later marry and have a family of his own. He kept Robert propped up in the window of his art studio, known as the turret room, which overlooked his front yard. Annette, Eugene's wife, was said to disapprove of Robert's presence in the house, and demanded that he be gotten rid of, or banished into the attic or basement. For a short time this took place, but naturally, Robert didn't take kindly to this, and apparently began to make threats towards her by visiting her in her dreams, and verbally telling Eugene that if he was not moved back, horrible things would happen to his family. So eventually, Robert was placed back in the turret room. Aside from this, I couldn't find any additional information on the happenings that took place during those years inside the home. I would hope and imagine that perhaps Robert had gone dormant during this time, especially since Eugene did eventually have children of his own and hopefully didn't allow them to be compromised by having such a thing in the house. There were, however, reports of passerbys, school children and neighbors, feeling a strange presence when passing by the house on a daily basis. Others would say that they could see Robert move, but in the blink of an eye, he would be back to where he was sitting. Eugene Otto would continue to spend the rest of his life painting in the turret room with Robert the Doll until his death in 1974. However, this bizarre legend does not stop with his death. Upon Eugene's passing, his family sold the house to a woman named Myrtle Reuter. Upon moving into the home, she noticed, sitting in the window of the turret room, was a small doll with a sailor's uniform. She thought this to be strange, since the Otto family had not left any other belongings behind when they had moved. But regardless, she decided to keep it. Myrtle soon began to realize that there was something different about this doll. Upon house cleaning, she would typically notice that he moved around the room, seemingly by himself. At night, she would hear what she described as small footsteps all throughout the house. Guests who would visit her claimed too that Robert would move of his own volition and that his blank expression would change to one of rage if anyone discussed him in a negative way. 
Myrtle would eventually reach out and speak with the widowed Annette Otto, who would confirm her worst fears, that something otherworldly inhabited Robert the Doll. After dealing with his antics for years, she finally decided to reach out to a local museum and would donate Robert in 1994 to the Fort East Martello Museum in Key West, Florida, where he remains today. But as with each previous relocation, his story does not end here either. Placed inside his own glass display for the public to see him each and every day, one would think that perhaps Robert's antics would cease. He was of course a natural source of curiosity and would be seen and admired by many people daily, but you would be very wrong. Staff at the museum have claimed to find Robert in various positions within his case, as if he was attempting to break out of it, or had been out of it prior, and had just re-entered it. The Phantom Footsteps, as previously claimed by all three families, has also been reported, as well as the doll's expression changing from neutral to nasty in an instant. The afflictions first started with the staff themselves, from horrible bouts of rare diseases to relationship breakdowns and marriage failures, as well as unique instances of psychosis. Over the years, the curse of Robert the Doll began to take shape and become a well-known phenomena, but it would soon spread to many others besides the staff themselves. Many people, upon visiting Robert's exhibit, finding him strange to say the least, would often mock him, berate him, or just laugh at his appearance. Little did they know that they would be inviting the wrath of something otherworldly. Shortly after their visit, droves of people began to experience shockingly similar happenings to that of the staff, varying in intensity, almost as if their punishment was being tapered to fit their crimes. From less serious experiences, like paranormal activity beginning in their home, horrible luck, and job loss to name a few, to much more serious experiences, like exotic disease diagnosis, rare cancers, relationship disintegration, and others, car accidents, falls, and even untimely death. Eventually, a warning would be added to Robert's exhibit, explaining the alleged curse and the proper etiquette to approach him with, whether that's to observe or take a photo, as to not offend whoever or whatever inhabits the doll itself. Over the decades, an entire wall has been dedicated to the letters people have dropped off or sent the museum if they weren't able to come in person begging for Robert's forgiveness, hoping to end whatever horrible situation they found themselves in after their visit. To this day, there are over a thousand letters, with more continuing to be added each and every year. But could there be more to this legend? As I mentioned in the beginning of the video, there is another origin story that could explain just what inhabits the doll and how it got there. I will also add several elements that I found interesting relating to the case itself. The alternative origin story says that a young woman of Bahamian descent gave Thomas Otto the doll as a retaliation for a misdeed. As to why this would have taken place is not known, but speculation has led many to believe that the girl or perhaps a relative had been a member of staff at some point or another at the family's Key West estate. The retaliation was that the doll had been imbued with a spirit that had been conjured using voodoo, and by trapping the entity within the doll, making it its vessel, it became aware of its surroundings and knew what it was sent there to do. Although with many details in this case, lots of details can't be corroborated due to the age of the story itself, but there are a few details that I managed to dig up that are interesting. The doll itself appears to have been manufactured by the Steiff Company, a German family company that was headed by German designer Richard Steiff, the original designer of the beloved teddy bear. And the original design of the doll in particular 
and others that were similar to it were not designed as toys, but rather stage props for the time. So it's hard to say if Robert was ever intended as a toy in the first place. The family tree of the Autos also has conflicting information in regards to birth and death dates, as well as names. But I did my best to corroborate this information, and I'll be linking the info in the description below. Today, Robert continues to be on display, and his antics continue to persist. He seems to be just as powerful as he was all those years ago. The museum keeps a cataloged record of all ailments that have been reported as a result of offending him for future reference. His reach also continues to expand as his legend grows and becomes more and more well known across the world. Robert the Doll has been the inspiration behind many books, movies, and podcasts, as well as a local legend in Florida. And this lesson truly applies to anyone and everyone. Have respect when you meet someone, because you never truly know who or what you could be dealing with. And please, if you find yourself at the East Martello Museum in Key West, Florida, and you happen to come into contact with the entity known as Robert the Doll, be respectful, because if you're not, you may just pay the ultimate price. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please do me a huge favor and like the video if you enjoyed watching it. Subscribe if you haven't already and share this video wherever you can. All those things are huge and they help me out so much more than you guys know. I would also like to thank DraftKings for sponsoring today's video. Please do me another huge favor and support the channel by supporting our sponsor today. Lastly, I would like to personally thank each and every one of you guys. We finally reached what seemed like the mythical milestone at one point of 100,000 subscribers, and I could not be more thankful and humble to have reached this point. I'm planning something much more formal, as well as a giveaway here pretty soon for that, but I did just want to say thank you guys for supporting me, and just know that without each and every one of you, Mystery Archives is nothing more than me making content that I would enjoy learning about and watching. So again, Thank you guys so, so much for everything. With that, I hope all of you are doing well. I hope that as we head towards the summer, that you are healthy mentally and spiritually, and that we all continue to have a wonderful year, despite any and all the hardships that we've faced thus far. And as always, this has been Cody here at Mystery Archives. And until next time, remember to stay safe out there and take care. Could an item, if given enough energy, devotion, and focus, begin to take on a life of its own? Could it begin to exhibit human-like characteristics, as if it has been imbued with or contains some kind of soul or entity inside of it? This act of magic has been practiced by multiple religions and cults throughout the ages. This is just one very strange example that it could indeed be possible. After a gracious gift was placed into the arms of a little girl, tragedy would strike, and what follows would continue to haunt the family, the citizens of the village, and would soon cross far beyond the barriers of land and sea. This is the untold story of Akiku, the haunted Japanese doll, and the bizarre paranormal force that possessed it. Japan is a very mystical and spiritual place, a place where the souls of the past seem to interact with the living. Such places where this spiritual energy seems to be most visible is throughout many of Japan's spiritual temples. Home to many religions, the two main ones being Buddhism and Shintoism, thousands of temples exist all over the country but one in particular houses a spiritual artifact that has a tragic backstory and an even more terrifying story that continues to be written to this day. Located in Hokkaido, Japan, at the Meninji Buddhist Temple, is a doll with a bizarre and tragic backstory indeed. 
Although there are several origin stories of how the doll came to be, and how the temple became its final living space, so to speak, all of them have most of the main details in common. Therefore, I'll be telling the most agreed upon origin story, to try and be as true to the legend as I can. The year is 1918 in Hokkaido, Japan, and a 17-year-old boy by the name of Ikigi Suzuki is in search of a gift for his little sister's birthday. As he pursues the different vendors and small shops, something soon catches his attention. In one of the store windows, he spots a small, childlike doll wearing a traditional Japanese kimono. Knowing that he had finally found something his sister will love, Ikiki quickly purchases the doll and makes his way back home through the countryside. As the family celebrates their little girl's birthday, Okiku is presented with the doll, and almost immediately, as soon as her eyes meet hers, she falls in love with him. The two from this point become inseparable. Wherever Okiku is, her doll is right by her side. She combs her hair, bathes her, dresses her, and treats her as if she was her little sister. The two even share meals and sleep side by side. The joy that the doll brought Okiku must have filled Ekiki's heart with such happiness, but soon that happiness would change to tragedy. One hot day, as the little girl played outside with her doll, she was bitten by a mosquito. This benign insect bite would soon manifest itself into a horrible case of malaria. Although the family did everything they could possibly do, Okiku would pass away, scared and gasping for air as she clutched her special doll all the way until the moment she took her last breath. Devastated, the Suzuki's planned to have their little girl buried with the doll since she loved it so much, but unfortunately, due to either governmental or religious oversight at the time, this wasn't an option. Instead, after they had laid Okiku to rest, the doll would be placed on a small family shrine located within the living quarters of their home as a tribute of sorts to their late daughter and their love for her. But shortly after the doll was placed on the shrine, very strange things began to happen. Hikiki, upon walking past the shrine one day, noticed that the doll's hair seemed significantly longer than what it had been when it was placed there. The hair, which was originally shoulder's length on the doll itself, and black, was now overgrown, with differing shades of brown hair also coming through and splitting at the ends. Finding this bizarre to say the least, he brought the discovery to his parents' attention, and unsure of what else to do, they trimmed the doll's hair. As the days came and went, the family began to have distressing dreams at night of their departed Okiku. Sometimes she would be scared and alone in the darkness, calling out to them, only being recognized by her voice. Other times, she would blame them for what happened to her. Each member of the family at differing times had these dreams, and they would soon lead all of them to believe that Akiku's soul wasn't peacefully resting. These disturbing dreams soon became all the stranger when the doll, which they began to refer to as a Kiku in their daughter's honor, would appear by their bedsides following these nightmares. One such incident involved the father of the family waking up in a cold sweat, only to be met face to face with the blank and lifeless stare of the doll. Unsure of what was taking place, the Suzuki's turned to their faith after contacting a local Buddhist priest and having a cleansing ritual be performed on their home and the doll, the activity seemed to grow and become stronger. Accompanying their ever-frequent nightmares and random movements of the doll, the chilling events grew into full-blown spiritual manifestations. During their waking life, they soon began to hear banging noises all throughout the house and the whispers of a little girl. Strange disembodied voices, varying from high-pitched, like those of a child, to the low groans 
of something unexplainable began to be heard. Their lights began to flicker on and off, and the paranormal activity seemed to happen more frequently as the calendar ticked closer to the birth and death dates of Akiku. These strange and terrifying happenings would continue over the course of the next 20 years, with multiple religious priests and shamans being contacted, and all coming to the same conclusion that after the cleansings failed time and time again, that the restless spirit of Akiku now inhabited the doll she once loved so much. Finally, needing a major change, and unable to deal with the ever-intensifying spiritual presence that seemed to haunt their home, the Suzukis relocated to a different district. Believing the doll to be the source of their various ailments and emotional torture that they had endured over the last two decades, they had no desire to take it with them. The family had reached the conclusion that if their daughter's soul wasn't at peace, what could perhaps be helping to fuel Okiku's power or magic was the close proximity of her grave to their home where the doll resided. So in order to distance the doll from the grave, the family approached the Menenji Buddhist temple in Hokkaido, and over the years, the doll's reputation for being haunted had spread throughout the community and indeed the majority of the country. This was more than likely due to the various interactions between the spiritual community and the Suzuki family. Finding the doll to be mesmerizing and possibly a unique opportunity to commute and interact with the dead if the stories were true, the leaders and priests of the Meninji Temple agreed to home Okiku permanently. As with many legends, we find lots of details to be exaggerated over time, and perhaps some of the details to not be true at all. And this is what the priests were originally thinking, that perhaps due to grief, the family was dealing with other spiritual ailments, perhaps unrelated to the doll, or causing the doll to be a vessel of sorts for restless spirits. However, as the years came and went, as Akiku now called the temple her home, they began to slowly but surely experience the same strangeness the Suzuki's had for all of those years. Akiku's hair continued to grow, and this baffled the priests. They would eventually have the hair trimmed and tested, and the hair was said to belong to a little girl. They found that the entity seemed to be appeased when her hair was trimmed and combed, and this led to less activity for a time, but the same activity, the knocking, banging, and disembodied voices, would soon plague the temple as well, and Okiku's power only seemed to grow. Any priest who seemed skeptical of the doll, or attempted to cleanse it themselves, soon had their dreams haunted as well, turning their sleep into restless fits. Their homes and rooms soon also began to manifest the very same activity that the temple was now exhibiting. With no remedy seeming to work, the leaders turned to appeasement instead, hoping that gestures of goodwill would keep the entity at bay. As years turn to decades, and as we've come into the 21st century, the priests of multiple generations now have overseen and cared for the doll known as Akiku. And though some of the more violent activity has faded, the general consensus is that she is now just as powerful as she was, or is perhaps more powerful as she's continued to age. It seems like as the more her fame and notoriety grows, the more visitors she has, the stronger she becomes. She continues to invade the dreams of those who come to visit her, and her hair is growing faster and more frayed. She is said to drive tourists mad who doubt her, with many people even reporting that besides seeing her strange hair and feeling a malevolent presence when visiting her, they've also had her stalk and appear in their dreams. Some more disturbing and recent reports have even suggested that her mouth is slowly opening and that if you dare to peer inside of it, you may just catch a glimpse of baby-like teeth sprouting from her porcelain gums, as if whoever or whatever she is is slowly turning to flesh and bone. 
The paranormal displays of her power continue to occur as well. Her permanent home located within the Menijin Temple is her own private shrine where she sits in a small wooden box on display. It is here that she watches and waits for anyone and everyone who dares to play with fire and invoke the power of the entity known as Okiku. But what are your thoughts? Was Okiku the girl trapped inside of the doll? In my opinion, although her spirit would be much older now. At the time of her death, she was either close to or was three years old, and no person at that age is capable of true malice, to the point to where she would become aware enough to begin to blame her parents and then torment them for decades to come. As children, our parents or our family are our entire world, so I find it incredibly difficult to think that these bizarre happenings were the result of her soul being restless and imbuing the doll. What I find more likely, and all the more interesting really, is the thought of invocation or the imbuing of the doll, like a conduit or a vessel of sorts. Akiku the girl was, as they said, inseparable from this doll. She fed it, bathed it, took naps with it, and everything else a small child would do with that wonderful imagination that they have. But could all of this dedication and focus, accompanied with the tragedy that took place, allow for a portal to open for an entity, whether non-human or a restless human spirit, to inhabit the doll? And by non-human, I mean a demon. This would make sense to me. Something that enjoys and grows more powerful off of pain and misfortune, or the emotional torment of others. As it causes the pain, it feeds off of it and grows ever stronger. This would not only explain the malevolent manifestations of whatever entity is present, but would also explain the still present force and the alleged ever growing power of it. And depending on the entity's strength, it could also explain why the cleansings thus far have failed. However, if you find yourself taking a trip to Japan anytime soon, or you happen to call Japan home, if you find yourself in Hokkaido, you may want to steer clear of the Menijin Temple, because if you don't, the entity that inhabits the doll known as Okiku may just use you as its next feeding source, where it'll begin to plague your dreams, making you twist and turn, sweat and fear, as it grows ever stronger and attempts to cross from its world into ours making our plane of existence its permanent residence. Thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like. Hit the subscribe button if you're new here to help our community grow and to help me out in the algorithm as we approach this massive milestone of 100,000 subscribers. I recently came across this story, and although it's a little different from the norm, I found it way too interesting and scary not to share with you guys. So I hope you liked it. Other than that, I hope you're all doing well. I hope you're taking care of yourselves physically, spiritually, and mentally as we continue to head yet further into this year. And just know that I truly appreciate each and every one of you. Until next time, this has been Cody here at Mystery Archives. Please, stay safe out there, and take care. Can a toy be haunted, let alone cause harm to anyone who comes into contact with it, or views its image? With seemingly unknown origins, but possessing an energy that radiates pure evil, the item, specifically the doll that we will be discussing today, is rumored to be able to not only affect people who come into contact with it in the flesh, but to even have the ability to reach you through the screens of your device. So if this is something you fear, a risk you potentially don't want to take, then I highly suggest you find another video to watch. This is the untold story of Peggy the doll and the malevolent presence that surrounds it. If you enjoy my content, then I know you'll enjoy a very similar style 
over at the missing chapter. This video was made possible by Bob Hicks and his amazing research and studio, which I used while visiting. Every case is unique and covered in an incredible style that makes the channel fantastic. So please take a few moments to go and check out his content. There is only so much information available on this particular case. All information has been researched using a variety of sources, including books, websites, and first-hand accounts. Please be aware that some names have been changed to protect the identity of those involved, and with such little information found, I have done my best to form the most cohesive story possible. I would also like to warn you that supposedly, viewing photos of Peggy or videos have caused distress, physical issues, and more. Shrouded in mysterious allure, the toy known as Peggy the Doll is said to house an otherworldly essence that radiates a profound feeling of evil. Intertwined with chilling terrors that have ensnared the collective curiosity of the public, believed to be in a perpetual state of unrest, it has captivated the minds of many since its initial discovery now nine years ago. The true origin of Peggy is unknown, but the world became aware of its existence in 2015. This very year, a woman who wishes for her identity to remain anonymous had been out at a local garage sale in her area in search of something cool to take home at a fair price. As she perused the various bins sat upon tables, seeing if anything interested her, out of the corner of her eye, she spotted an adorable looking doll with blonde hair beaded blue eyes, and a small white dress adorning her. Feeling some kind of pull towards the doll, and feeling as if she would enjoy the presence of a new companion, she quickly purchased the toy that in due time she would start calling Peggy. But almost as soon as Peggy entered her life and was placed inside of her home, strange things began to happen. The woman began to have horrendous nightmares every single night. Ones that were so bad that when she woke up, she'd be laying in a pool of her own sweat, unable to catch her breath. Day after day, the increasingly ominous empty gaze of Peggy stared into her soul, slowly but surely increasing her anxiety. And night after night, these horrendous nightmares would continue to induce terror. In a short period of time, the persistent force made the air so thick that you could cut it with a knife. Roughly three weeks upon the purchase of the doll and the start of the nightmares, the woman dreaded inevitably falling asleep each night. She had also come to the personal conclusion that something was indeed very wrong with Peggy. Each night in her nightmares, she was being pursued by some kind of entity that for the longest time she was unable to see. And yet, each night's sleep would mirror the last, and each one, the story, seemed to progress. Upon drifting off into dreamland, she would find herself back in the same terrifying circumstances in which she had been in previously, and what she saw was truly disturbing. Slowly, the entity that pursued her, which at first was masked by darkness, began to reveal itself. It formed a figure, the figure of a doll. And over time, the doll began to become a hideous amalgamation between that of a doll and an old woman, a grotesque monstrosity, one that would leave her shaking in utter distress. This shook this poor lady to her core, especially since she had never experienced anything like this before. Believing this to be a manifestation of evil, she tried various methods to quell the abyss that seemed to take such great interest in her after Peggy entered her life. She tried moving the doll to various spots within her home, but that didn't seem to work. She consulted two priests at two different churches, both of which, whose blessings, didn't seem to work. If anything, this seemed to make the circumstances so much worse. Peggy began to move around on her own, and in conjunction with this, she began breaking multiple items within the home as well. 
she finally, out of desperation, moved Peggy into her shed, hoping that with the doll being outside of the home, that her torment would cease. This, however, failed, and if anything, seemed to anger whatever entity was present. Seemingly exhausting all known options at the time, and out of desperation, and hours of research, she found and emailed someone who she believed would be equipped to help her and or figure out just what was taking place. A renowned British paranormal investigator, a woman by the name of Jane Harris, who ran the organization Haunted Dolls. After a brief correspondence, Harris agreed to accept Peggy the doll, so it was placed in the post and mailed to her. But as the doll made its long journey to Harris's residence, little did she know that she too would become one of the entity's victims. The doll would arrive in a tan box upon Harris's doorstep roughly three weeks later. When she brought the box inside of her home, as soon as her foot crossed the threshold, she would later say that it was as if the whole energy seemed to shift within her house. As she unboxed the toy and presented it to the first rays of light it had seen in nearly a month, she almost immediately began the induction process. She set aside a space for Peggy and attempted to establish a baseline to see if anything abnormal seemed to be coming from the doll. Placing her within a glass stand, her and several of her colleagues began to set up night vision cameras, digital cameras, and motion detectors. After this was done, they examined it with an EMF meter, but nothing at first seemed to be odd about the doll other than the feeling Harris had upon bringing it into her home. They left the doll for an overnight examination to see if any of their cameras or motion detectors picked up on anything, but after the first night, they would discover nothing. Despite the lack of findings, the team's protocol would dictate that the next step would be to bring in several mediums to try and see if they felt anything in regards to the object. This, however, takes time and schedule, so in the meantime, it would have to essentially sit on the back burner. It was now November of 2015, and approximately six weeks after Peggy the doll had arrived on the doorsteps of Jane Harris. Strangely, almost out of the blue, because she wasn't known to have issues like these before, Jane was suddenly hit with an unyielding, debilitating fatigue. Barely able to move, she remained bedridden for roughly two weeks, and that's when her body began to be racked with horrible migraines accompanied with nausea. This would cause her to not only put a pause on her normal paranormal works, but she was also unable to care for her two young children. Despite getting eight to nine hours of solid sleep a night, plus naps due to the exhaustion, and suffering for several weeks, Harris's condition was not improving. Three doctors had ran all sorts of tests, and yet nothing was coming back abnormal. Blood tests ruled out thyroid issues. She had no signs of anemia or any other kind of illness for that matter. Left with no other explanation, Jane had to consider the possibility, since it was the only factor that had recently changed in her life, that perhaps her ailed state was a result of the presence of Peggy the doll. Wanting an outside opinion, she decided to contact a friend and clairvoyant whom she had worked with on other cases, a medium named Patricia Redman. On November 13th, roughly a week after being asked, Patricia would agree to take and examine Peggy. And for the first time in over a month, Jane slowly but surely began to feel better. She wasn't drained of energy. Her constant migraines and nausea were gone. And her skin, which had taken quite the gray tone since she had fallen ill, began to go back to normal. Redmond would have the doll for approximately three weeks and agreed to return it to Harris, but not before casting a spell of protection upon it in hopes that if the doll was affecting her, that it would no longer bother her during her studies. Her conclusion, and strangely, what would become the conclusion of three other psychics over the course of the investigation, was that Peggy contained the spirit of a woman from London, England. It is thought that she is possessed by the spirit of a woman 
born in 1946 in London's Holland Park, who died of a chest-related condition, possibly an asthma attack. The readings would further uncover that the woman was persecuted and had a very hard life, that she disliked clowns and cats, and that she died horribly and alone of asphyxiation, cold, and by herself. Could this perhaps be why she was so angry in death? And why did she inhabit the doll to begin with? These questions perhaps will never be answered or have yet to be uncovered. During the course of the investigation, through her social media for haunted dolls, Jane began to post updates regarding Peggy the doll, as she would with any of the items or other objects the group would be involved with. The photos and videos of Peggy began to draw visceral reactions from those who viewed them in conjunction with strange manifestations of the paranormal. And not just a handful of people over the years, hundreds have poured in, leading most to believe that there has to be some kind of correlation. These experiences people have had range from horrible headaches, anxiety, and nausea, to shortness of breath, abnormal heartbeat, and more. With others, their computers freezing upon the image of Peggy, light bulbs exploding, and in one instance, a candle falling over and causing a small fire. These are just some of the comments that have been said upon viewing the images and videos. Upon viewing the doll, I had a full-blown asthma attack, which hasn't occurred in almost a decade, our Tromans. I've had a migraine and palpitation since seeing your doll. Please contact me, J. Claire. This is so strange. Can dogs and cats sense evil? Since I opened the photo of that doll, my little terrier, Molly, has been snarling and growling at the screen. I'm a bit freaked out. J. Carlton. One woman, upon viewing an image of Peggy, had a dream that some kind of figure was chasing her cat and eventually caught it as it was running up to her door. Upon waking up and going to check on her beloved pet, after not finding it within her home, she checked her front door and found the cat no longer alive. It was as if it had been mauled. Eventually, the doll would find a new home at the Haunted Museum, owned by controversial paranormal investigator, Zach Pagans. Here she resides in her own space, in a glass display, where people continue to experience strange feelings and occurrences as a result of being within her presence. But before we go, this case to me poses several questions which I'd like to address. First of which, if we take things at face value, if Peggy was possessed, why would the spirit choose to inhabit a doll and then also cause so much torment? I've found that if a spirit is restless and angry in life, then odds are they become lost souls when they die and may seek something to inhabit that would allow them to gain access to people and or their homes to which they can take out their frustration, just like people which they were. If they're evil or angry in life, odds are they will be in death as well. Were the nightmares the result of an overactive imagination, it is pretty well known that some entities like to infiltrate dreams. Why this is a thing is uncertain, perhaps to cause distress in which they can feed upon. And what about the physical ailments? This perhaps could have been a coincidence if it hadn't affected so many people over the years, or so they claim. The odds that so many people would express physical issues or strange manifestations as a result of seeing or being in contact with the doll is indeed odd. And lastly, was it even a human spirit inhabiting the vessel at all, or perhaps something inhuman? These questions and more, of course, will likely never be able to answer, which leaves this case shrouded and yet more mystery. So if you find yourself being pulled towards a particular item, unless you are vastly experienced, you may want to give its allure a second thought, because this calling could potentially open up a nightmarish world of torment, harassment, and terror. Thank you guys so much for watching this new video. Please don't forget to give it a like, a share, and subscribe if you're new here. I did also want to say if I missed a question or if you have your own question or thoughts, please leave me a comment down below. 
There are multiple things in the works, including several new videos, so as always, your patience is greatly appreciated. I did also want to thank the sponsor of today's video and remind you guys to please go check out the missing chapter, which I'm linking down below. Bob helped me out so much with this video and I can't thank him enough. And other than that, until next time guys, this has been Cody here at Mystery Archives. I love you all, and please, remember to stay safe out there, and take care. I'll see you next time. When a young woman receives a birthday gift of a doll from her mother, she is first elated, believing it to make a wonderful companion. But when the doll begins to move on its own, it soon reveals its malevolent nature. It will take the expertise of renowned demonologists and priests to help free them from the entity that now infests their lives. Will they make it out alive before it's too late? This is the untold story of Annabelle, the demonic doll of Connecticut. And this story just may make you think twice about your keepsakes. Our story begins in 1970. 25-year-old Deirdre Bernard has recently moved into her first apartment with her two friends. An engaged couple named Laura Clifton and Cal Randell. Her mother had bought her a gift for her birthday and hoped that it would keep her daughter's spirits up and spread joy to her new home as she pursued her education in nursing. Deirdre loved the gift, finding its rosy red cheeks with hair to match to be a fun companion for her new journey in life. Shortly after admiring her new doll, she placed it on her bed with its arms and legs out. For the next several days, it became routine for Deirdre to come home from her studies, spend time with the doll, and then place her back in the exact same position with its arms and legs out on her bed. Oddly, however, after the first several days of this new routine, the young woman began to notice that something wasn't quite right. Every morning she would lay her doll back on her bed before heading to school, with its arms and legs stretched out. Yet every night upon her return, she would find the doll in different positions. Sometimes, the doll's legs would be crossed, and other times, its arms. And as the days went on, it would even start to be seen in different parts of her room, oftentimes with its arms pointed outward. But Deirdre's room would not be its only occupied space. The doll would begin to be found in various positions all over the apartment. And Deirdre wasn't the only person who was witnessing these bizarre manifestations. Her two roommates would seem to bear witness to them as well. One evening, Deirdre returned home with her roommate Laura, who was also a trainee nurse at the time, and her fiancé Cal. Upon opening the door to their apartment, they would find the doll kneeling before them in a chair facing the door as if it had been waiting for them to return. This not only scared everyone, but especially Deirdre, because she knew for a fact that as per her routine, that she had placed the doll on her bed that very morning. It had inexplicably moved on its own. To try and make sense of all this, they moved the doll and then tried to reposition it back into its original kneeling stance the same one they had seen when initially walking through the door. But each time they tried to replicate the position, due to the design of the doll, this proved impossible. The movement of the doll, as well as its position now, left the trio at a loss for words. The only conclusion they could draw from the situation was that some kind of force was manipulating the doll. Deirdre would place the doll back in its normal position on her bed for the night, but this experience would be far from the last for all of them. 
just several days following the previously mentioned happening, a new phenomenon began to manifest. Little notes, written in pencil, on parchment paper, began to be found randomly throughout the apartment, and at random times. The messages included such phrases as help us or help Cal. But despite the messages urgent requests for help, no one was able to figure out just what they were referring to because none of them were experiencing an urgent situation, including Cal. And weirder still, none of them kept parchment paper or pencils. This realization just further deepened the mystery that was now unfolding before their very eyes. At first, they believed that possibly someone was breaking into their apartment to play pranks on them. So in order to check if this indeed was the case, Deirdre and Laura began leaving marks around the windows and doors. Marks that, if disturbed, would show later on. They also rearranged their furniture in an effort to ensure that if anyone was entering their apartment unannounced, that they would leave a trace. But again, later that night, upon their return from their studies, none of the furniture had been disturbed, nor had any of their marks. Yet, the doll had moved rooms. Frightened and perplexed at this point, the trio tried to come up with some potential solutions. But as they individually gave them thought, day in and day out, the doll would continue to move on its own accord, positions, and places. One day, the three would return yet again, as per their routine, to find the doll yet again in another part of the apartment. But this time, there was something different. This time, they found it sat with some kind of liquid on its hands. Upon a closer look, they were even more frightened, because the liquid appeared to be blood. And this blood was all over the doll's hands, as well as three distinct dots of blood were also on its chest. Terrified, the three sat in the living room and tried to figure out some kind of game plan on how to handle the paranormal situation they found themselves in. Deidre would grab a phone book from the cupboard and begin flicking through the pages as the group talked. One of her fingers would finally rest on a psychic medium's number. During the brief call, they would explain that they had been experiencing ghostly type activity within their apartment, but they did not inform her about the doll specifically. She would arrive the following day to see what she could do to help. As she walked through the apartment, she began to explain to Laura and Deirdre about the spirit she felt had inhabited the building. The ladies would eventually make their way to Deirdre's room, where the doll currently sat. They asked what the medium felt in regards to the doll. Upon examining it, she said she felt a strong presence surrounding the object, but informed the two that she would need to conduct a seance around it in order to discover more information. So, a seance was agreed to. As the ritual was conducted around the doll, the medium began to divulge information to Laura and Deirdre. She claimed that she had channeled the spirit of a seven-year-old little girl named Annabelle Higgins. She said that Annabelle used to play in the area long before the houses and apartment buildings were there, back when all that existed were fields. Many innocent and happy hours were passed here until suddenly they ended. Annabelle was confused as to what had happened to her, to which the medium interpreted to be her death. And since her death, the child had wandered the place she was the happiest, the fields. Once the apartments were built upon them, the halls quickly became a lonely place for her to haunt. With the lifestyles of most modern people requiring work most of the time, this meant that Annabelle had no one to play with. But then, one day, two young women brought with them 
a playful looking doll. Finally, she had something to play with again. And more so, she had the comfort of two young women who she believed would be more empathetic and accepting of her and would allow her to play with them. Through the vessel of the medium, Annabelle would ask if she could live in the doll and be with Deirdre and Laura. Touched by the young girl's story, the two women agreed and following the seance, they would name the doll Annabelle in the young girl's honor. A truly nice gesture from the two of them. However, upon agreeing to have Annabelle inhabit the doll and stay with them is when the haunting truly began. Convinced now that they were sharing a space with Annabelle, they began to treat the doll as a living, breathing person. It was no longer a lifeless toy, but the young and lonely little girl. Regardless of the two ladies' compassion, Cal was not so convinced. He sensed that something was very off in regards to this entire situation, and believed that no good would come of it. He thought the doll could possibly be some kind of trickster or a conduit that disguised its true intentions. And in time, perhaps, he was right. In the weeks following the seance, Cal began to feel ill at most times of the day, with no rational origin. And at night, every night, he began to have horrible nightmares. These experiences culminated with Cal waking up one night to find Annabelle gliding over his body. Before he could react, the doll's hands were on either side of his neck, strangling him, its large, void-like eyes staring into his as it sought to steal his life. In a later interview, Cal would describe the event like this. While I was lying there, I suddenly woke up, and something seemed wrong to me. I looked around the room, but nothing was out of place. But then, I looked down towards my feet, and I saw the rag doll Annabelle. It was slowly gliding up my body. It moved over my chest and stopped. Then, it put its two arms out. One arm touched one side of my neck, and the other touched the other side like it was making an electrical connection. Then, I began to be strangled. I was writhing and trying to push the doll off my chest, but I might as well have been pushing on a wall, because it wouldn't move. As hard as he pushed against the doll, it would not budge, and just as he felt like he was slipping into unconsciousness, with every fiber of his being, he pushed back, and finally, was able to throw the doll away from him. However, despite a terror struck but relieved Cal, this would be far from the last time that Annabelle would seek to destroy. One night, when Deirdre was out of the apartment, Laura and Cal were spending time together in the living room. This relaxing time, however, was quickly interrupted with a large banging sound that emanated from Deirdre's room. The couple, confused as to what it could be, rushed to find the source. With Cal headed in first, they threw the door open, expecting to see someone. But to their surprise, they were only met with the icy gaze of Annabelle. She was staring at them from the floor, as if she had been tossed aside by someone. Cal walked over to the doll and went to pick it up, but suddenly, he dropped Annabelle and screamed in pain. The young man winced in agony as white-hot slashes lashed his chest. A small pool of blood began to form in the middle of his shirt as he frantically darted towards the door. Laura was paralyzed with fear as her boyfriend had been attacked by something that neither of them could see. The two would run out of the room and back to the living room as soon as possible praying to God that this force wasn't pursuing them. When they reached the sofa, Laura pulled up Cal's blood-soaked shirt to find several large gashes on his chest that looked like claw marks. 
By now, it was becoming increasingly clear that Annabelle sought to harm them. Upon informing Deirdre of what had happened while she was gone, when she arrived back at the apartment, the three, unsure of what else to do, contacted a local priest for help. He would in turn request permission to help from his superiors, and his superiors then passed on the information to paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren. The Warrens were intrigued by what was allegedly taking place and decided to pursue the case in hopes of helping the young trio. Upon arriving at their apartment, hearing each person's testimonies, and observing how the space felt, as well as the doll itself, the Warrens believed the happenings to be a result of a heavy demonic infestation. They believed that the demon didn't specifically haunt just their apartment, but rather the building itself and the land around it, that it had seen the doll as a way in. They further explained that the seance had essentially allowed the demon to communicate directly with them, to be invited into their lives. All of those who were present and taking place in the ritual were highly vulnerable spiritually, and this opened them up to manipulation from the demon, which spun a false narrative that it was instead the spirit of little, lonely Annabelle. Then, following the seance, Deirdre and Laura had paid credence to the doll instead of ignoring it, which only fed the demon more energy. It would then continue to feed off them by manipulating their caring and maternal emotions, since the women were powerless to resist, feeling sorry for the little girl who just wanted to play and be cared for. But once the women had accepted the demon into their lives, they and everyone around them became fair game. The entity no longer had to masquerade itself. It was free to unleash its true form. The couple had sensed that the demon was a very powerful one, given how strong it had continued to grow and infest their lives, given its proclivity to violence. If left unchecked, it would have probably tried to kill one or all of them within the next several weeks. After explaining the seriousness of the situation they found themselves in, the Warrens then contacted a priest they frequently worked with on demonic cases, a man named Father Everett and Father Everett agreed to come and bless the apartment in an attempt to weaken or drive out the demon entirely. In due time, he too would arrive and conduct the blessing. Once Father Everett was finished and had departed, the Warrens warned the group that if the blessing hadn't driven the demon out, that it at this time was severely weakened, but could potentially come back with a vengeance. Believing the doll to be a conduit, at Deirdre's request, the Warrens took Annabelle with them when they left. Deirdre, Laura, and Cal were now thankfully free of the demonic entity that had plagued their lives. However, Annabelle's story is far from over. The Warrens' problems seemed to begin as soon as Annabelle was stuffed into Ed's briefcase. As the couple was headed home, they began to experience engine issues in their vehicle, which almost resulted in multiple head-on collisions. The demonic entity was causing the power steering and brakes to fail, and even the engine to stall. Once they were able to finally get back home, the doll would be placed within the Warren's office, specifically within Ed's chair. In the days to come, the Warrens would begin to witness the doll manifesting paranormal activity within their very house. The doll was seen levitating on several occasions and began to frequently teleport to different rooms. And the same little notes written with pencil on parchment paper began to appear with all too familiar phrases such as help me and then now help us. On top of this, one evening, 
while she was alone, Lorraine began to hear what she described as loud rolling growls that reverberated within the walls and throughout their entire house. Following this night, the Warrens would be visited by Father Daniel Mills, the Catholic priest the couple were also working with. Upon inquiring about their dealings with the doll, the priest made the mistake of picking up Annabelle and telling her that you are nothing but a rag doll and you can't hurt anything. As the priest laughed, Ed warned him to never touch or say anything like that to the doll ever again. As he prepared to leave, Lorraine warned the priest to please drive carefully because her clairvoyance had revealed to her an impending tragedy involving a young priest. Appreciating her concern but writing the situation off, Father Mills departed the Warren's residence. A few hours later, he would be involved in a near-fatal car accident, which totaled his vehicle, after his car's brakes had mysteriously failed. Upon receiving the news that the priest was hurt but would survive following the accident, the Warrens decided to lock Annabelle away in hopes that she would never be able to hurt anyone ever again. They would douse her in holy water and place her within a blessed glass case. A blessed crucifix would also be placed on the outside of the box, as well as a warning sign asking anyone who may come across the doll not to touch it. The doll was then placed in their occult item collection. Although Annabelle was now sealed away in hopes that she would no longer harm anyone, her power still seems to affect those who visit her. After Ed passed away, Lorraine, in several interviews, would refer to Annabelle as one of the most evil objects she had ever come into contact with. Besides numerous bouts of bad luck, some people have even said to have encountered death as a result of meeting her, as well as others losing their minds completely and ending up in psychiatric care for the rest of their earthly existence. One day, a young man visited the Warrens' museum and clearly did not think things through. He went up to and challenged the doll, wanting the worst of whatever it had to offer. He had apparently driven to the museum with his girlfriend on his motorcycle. Upon their departure, three hours into their trip home, the man would lose control of his vehicle and would hit a tree at a very high speed. He would die almost instantly due to the impact. His girlfriend, on the other hand, survived but would remain hospitalized for over a year. Was this particular instance coincidence, or the demon inhabiting the doll inflicting exactly what it had to offer? Although the Warrens did explain how the demon came into the doll, it begs a bit of a deeper question, one that we've seen reoccurring multiple times over our various coverage of haunted objects, and that is how much attention is too much attention or dedication when it comes to objects, as it seems like depending on your spiritual state and location, that dedication or that imbuement could potentially open a door or create a vessel for something malicious to make its way in. I know that the Warrens are controversial figures, now even in death, but regardless, they are integral to many of the paranormal stories we have and will have covered future. But what do you think? Was Annabelle truly possessed? Was the whole case legitimate or a hoax? And with these questions, you may find yourself wondering, where is the Annabelle doll today? Annabelle remains sealed in the same box she was placed in 50 years ago. Ed and Lorraine's daughter, Judy Spira, and her husband, Tony, continue to hold the torch for the Warrens and their work. Annabelle is on display for all to see at the Occult Museum, and if you choose to visit, 
if you happen to find yourself staring into her big, dark eyes. Just know that if you stare too long into the abyss, the abyss just may stare back at you. Thank you guys so much for watching this new video. This topic in particular has been requested hundreds of times, so I hope I did all of those requests justice. Please give this video a like if you enjoyed it, subscribe with notifications on, and share this video around. All those things help me out a ton. That's why I ask you guys to do them all the time. I did also just want to announce here, and I will also be doing some separate promotional videos for something I've never done before, which is a meet and greet. So I will be a guest at the 2023 Tennessee Haunts and Legend Expo, which will take place on Saturday, October 21st at the Nashville Fairgrounds. There's going to be a ton of stuff to do and see and lots of scary stories and legends to learn about. So if you'd like the opportunity to meet me, I will have a booth there. I'll have some shirts, some cards, and probably some other stuff. And I'd be happy to chat with you guys. I'll also be joined by my co-host Hayden from the Mystery Archives podcast. So come out, have a great time, and see how boring I actually am. Other than that, guys, I hope you're all having a great October, and I wish you nothing but the absolute best. As always, this has been Cody here at Mystery Archives. Remember to stay safe out there, and take care.